Good morning, Mr. Marsh. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Glad to be here today. Good. Um, well, we have a few questions for you to hopefully just enrich UGA students and give us a little bit of advice as we approach real life. <laughs> um, so the first question for you is, what is the most challenging thing that you have dealt with as a leader? I think uh, from my perspective, it's, it's making sure you, you maintain credibility in your organization and integrity. Uh, not to say we, we have bad people in the organization, but you're the business world is so influenced by what takes place at other organizations, you have to work extra hard to make sure you stay above all that. Uh, so to do that, you have to make sure you, you hire the right people, uh, you train people, you, you encourage them to, to do the right things and to keep people informed about you know what, what's up in the organization so people aren't wondering. Uh, the, the, clearer, the clearer message they've got, the, the better off for them. We, we talk about uh, transparency of operations and consistency of results is kind of the message we take to Wall Street when we go. So we try to live up to that expectation. That, that's that's a challenge every day to do that. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. And I guess going off of that, um, how do you personally lead from your core values, and what are those core values? Uh, there, there are a lot of them. Uh, the the one that is most important to me is making sure that we treat our people fairly. Uh, you, you work with a lot of different people. Uh, no leader has ever made it uh, anywhere in the world without a lot of folks behind him or, or her, and you can't forget that. I mean, you know, you're, you're not a leader unless somebody's following you. That's true. <laughs> and uh, the ability for people to, to follow you is it's optional. Uh, so you have to convince people you you got a clear clear path that it's worth going down, and that you're going to do things uh, the right way, and it's the right way for the organization. And looking out, and I don't, in my company, we're looking out for shareholders, customers, and and employees. And you can't it's forget either one of those groups because they're they're all important. But the employees I put very close to the top of that list because at the end of the day, they're going to do most of the hard work in terms of the day-to-day -day things that, that need to be done. So if you don't have your credibility with that group and be consistent in the way you do that and, and make sure you treat everybody fairly, whether it's the newest person that's come on or the person that's been there 35 years, they're they're all important. Good. Um, so I was just curious, why did you make the decision to go from public accounting into industry? <laughs> <laughs> I've been asked that uh, many times. Uh, when I'm I, accounting, so right. of course but I But when I left decision. Georgia, uh, I was in accounting, I went to work for Deloitte and Touche, a um, public accounting firm, and, and really enjoyed it. Uh, accounting was what I majored in and I uh, found that to be kind of a, the love of my business life and had a lot of fun doing that. And, Working for the different industries, I saw a lot of different types of industries, which was a lot of fun. I love to be out in the field and, and see the different companies. But I had spent so much time on, on public utilities and became a public utility specialist uh, that I really had a, a yearning to do more in, in that field and understand more about that business that you could just learn from the accounting and auditing side. So I made the, the, the bold step to, to jump the fence. And I had somebody tell me one time that was a very boring industry. <laughs> Well, it's been anything but boring, I can I can promise you. And uh, I just love the challenge and, and working with the large groups of people. Good, good. Um, so what advice would you give to UGA students who are about to enter the workforce? <laughs> Be patient. You know, you, you learn from your experiences. Uh, you know, things don't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. And every experience you go through is, a, is an opportunity to, to take something away. You know, whether you feel like you were successful or, you know, I hate to say failure, but you learn from failure. I've, I've had plenty of failures along the way, me personally, uh, as well as things I've seen our company, you know, fail at, things that I thought we could have done a better job. So you learn from those experiences, and you learn from the people around you. Uh, I do a little experiment a lot of times when I, when I speak to people. I tell them, write down all the jobs you've had, and I, I consider a job anything you did where somebody paid you for it, whether it was delivering newspapers or, you know, washing windows, cutting the grass for your neighbor, because you interact with people when you do that, and you learn how to interact with people. Uh, you meet a lot of different personalities, and you have to learn to accept those personalities. Because today, <laughs> the world is a lot different than it was when I started out in the, in the 70s uh, in the business world. So you have to learn to work with those personalities and, and embrace that. Uh, so I would tell people, get along, figure out how to get along. Uh, you know, you can, you can disagree, but you can't be disagreeable, is what one of our board members <laughs> tells me. So, you know, debate yeah. is good. Uh, you have to look at different views, and if you're going to be a part of a successful team, you have to have the diversity on that team. I mean, you use sports analogies, you know, you wouldn't have a great football team if all you had was quarterbacks, or you exactly. wouldn't have a great baseball team if all you had was a pitcher. You have to have people that do different things, and it's the same way in the business world. So you have to embrace that diversity and, and learn from your experience. Well, good. Um, our last question this morning is, 
how do you cultivate leaders within Scanna? Because you're obviously invited here because you are a leader. And we like to emphasize well, that. I, I tell people I didn't I didn't start out to be a leader. <laughs> that wasn't something that I, I run on the top of my list. I just wanted to be successful and mm -hmm. be able to, to raise a family and, and, and live a good life. And I had opportunities that, that were put in front of me, and I, and I took risk. So you, know, you, you have to take risk. If you don't take risk, you're not likely to become a leader. You have to take calculated risk. You don't take wild risk. But uh, you know, be willing to do that. Uh, you know, be willing to take on challenges that others might not want to take on. Uh, you might want to have. You might have to move two or three times before you find you know, what's just right for you. It may not be you know a physical move from your from your home. But it might be moves around the organization. I've had eight or nine different jobs within the same company and all of those have taught me something. So I would tell people, you know, be adaptable. You know, don't, don't be too rigid and, and be willing to take a little risk along the way to, to find those opportunities and you'll stumble into leadership. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Thank you so much for answering these. Glad to do it. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. <laughs> Look forward to it. Thank you. My name is Brittany Sink and I'm a third year accounting major and Leonard Leadership Scholar here at the Terry College. It is with great pleasure that I introduce to you a family friend, Mr. Kevin Marsh, who serves as chairman and CEO of Scana Corporation in Columbia, South Carolina. Mr. Marsh earned his BBA in accounting here at EGA, and I must say that he is one of the most loyal Bulldogs you'll ever meet. He began his career with Deloitte and Touche. In 1984, he joined South Carolina Electric and Gas Company, the principal subsidiary of Scana Corporation, where he has served as vice president of corporate planning and controller. He then served as Vice President of Finance, Treasurer, and Controller of Scana. In 1996, Mr. Marsh was named Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Scana, and he became Senior Vice President two years later. He assumed responsibilities as Chairman and CEO in December of 2011, and he has done an incredible job of representing them since. Outside of his success in the business world, Mr. Marsh and his wife have two daughters and two wonderful grandchildren. He has many words of wisdom to share, so you all are in for a treat. Once again, please join me in welcoming our guest this morning, Mr. Kevin Marsh. I appreciate the opportunity, appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and share some thoughts with you today. I, I kind of look back to see who had been here before me, and I think you've had uh, two two U.S. senators that have come this way, and I think with a 14% approval rating from Congress. I probably got a pretty good chance as a public utility executive to, to, to hopefully do better than that. But it's, <laughs> it's always good to, to be back home. I didn't just go to school here. I, I grew up here. I grew up in the, in the Five Points area. Uh, my dad was the Episcopal chaplain here at the university from, from 1965 to 1996. So I, I tell people Athens is a great place to grow up. Sometimes it's a hard place to find a job, but it's a terrific place to, to grow up. So I... Always good to be back and, and, and see friends and, and family that are, that are still here. But I got to tell you, living in Columbia has been tough for the past three years. Uh, having lost three straight years to the Gamecocks, and it gets pretty uh, rabid over there because being the, one of the newest members of the, the SEC, they, they take their football seriously. And if we don't win this year, I may just have to find a job back this way because I'm not sure I can stand it. And we open up with Clemson as our first game this year, so we got a couple of challenges uh, right out of the box. Uh, but it's good to be here, and I want to share some thoughts with you today. You might not know uh, who, who Scanna is. Well, if I can get up here and roll to this next slide. Tell you a little bit about us. Uh, we're principally, we're headquartered in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, principally focused on uh, utility operations. Our, our largest subsidiary is South Carolina Electric and Gas Company. From a size perspective, whether it's earnings or assets or people, however you want to slice it, that's about 90, 85 to 90 percent of our business. Uh, we sell electricity and, and gas in South Carolina. They're indicated by the, by the green areas. We have about almost 5,800 megawatts of generating capacity, uh, close to 670,000 electric customers that we serve, and a little over 300,000 natural gas customers. We acquired a gas company in North Carolina called uh, PSNC Energy uh, back around, I guess it was around 2000, 2001, uh, which is headquartered right out in Gastonia, uh, west of Charlotte. Uh, you can see the service territory we serve there on the, on the North Carolina side. And we also have Carolina Gas Transmission. Uh, you can pick that out with the black pipelines that are indicated across South Carolina. But it does just reach into Georgia there at the, at the lower end because we have the opportunity to bring in the liquefied natural gas from overseas and push that into the state of South Carolina, which gives us some great opportunities when gas is not flowing uh, from the Gulf. We can bring it in uh, that way, which makes it uh, pretty good for our customers. 
we came to Georgia probably around 1998 uh, in an unregulated venture. We say unregulated, but there's still a lot of regulations around serving the customers here in Georgia. Uh, Na Georgia Natural Gas is one of our largest competitors. It used to be Atlanta Gas Light, but somebody that might go back that far. Uh, they decided they were not going to have a regulated business, that they were going to deregulate the market. And i got a great story to tell about that a little bit later if we have time. But we came to Georgia in 1998, and we're now the second largest uh, provider of natural gas uh, sales in, in Georgia. If you're not a SCANA Energy customer, if you take natural gas, I'll have some applications I can give you when we get through. <laughs> so, and that includes you too, Tim. But, uh, I am I'm joined today by my, my closest friend and, and scholar, uh, Tim Cadle, who's still around this area, and his, and his son Walter and his wife are here today. Glad to have them come hear me speak. Uh, I tried to keep Tim honest uh, while we are in school. We were pretty competitive when it came to the scores. He gives me credit for uh, convincing him to go into accounting. I'm not sure if that's really true, but it, it was great to have you as a pal going through, and I appreciate you coming out today to, to hear me speak. You know, the leadership is, is something that uh, is, is very important. Uh, if I talk about, you know, what we need today, we, we definitely need some help because if I talked about these, these business scandals, I'm not going to go into all of these, but, you know, Enron, Bernie Madoff, uh, the LIBOR, you know, rate rigging situation we saw here several months ago or, or Penn State University. You know, Enron is probably the oldest one up here, but it had a huge impact on the financial world and uh, cost one major accounting firm its, uh, its existence by the time it was all said and done with. So a big event, uh, certainly some failures in leadership there. Uh, you talk about Bernie Madoff, uh, you know, defrauded, I think it was about 65 or $70 billion uh, from investors. Uh, certainly examples that, that aren't good uh, for the business world. Uh, the LIBOR uh, rate rigging scandal, you know, the bank manipulated the LIBOR rates to help them make some profits on, on trades they were making in the financial markets. And Penn State uh, is not at all a financial failure, uh, but it's certainly a failure in leadership uh, at the top. So when, when I think about leadership, you know, leadership reaches well beyond uh, the financial world, and I don't know how you can have leadership in your life without having that impact to the business you work in every day, or if you're going to practice leadership in your organization, I don't know how you cannot take that home with you. So I, I don't see those two as really separate. So while some of the largest leadership failures we see may be in the financial world, you also see those in the non-financial situation. And uh, we, work, we work hard at our company uh, to make sure we don't, don't lose that moral compass and we do things uh, the right way. And we have many opportunities uh, to do that. As a, as a public utility, you know, we're charged with, uh, with serving customers. And we have a unique role. We're not just responsible for the customers we serve. We have to look out for the employees and make sure we keep good relationships with our regulatory commissions. And I put some of the examples up here where we have opportunities uh, to have leadership. You know, we provide an essential service, whether it's electricity or gas, you know, people rely on us to have that service there when they need it. I probably don't need to get a show of hands to find out who's upset when your power goes out. Okay, it's, it's not a good experience, especially if it's for the big game. If you're going to watch the Super Bowl this weekend, you don't want your electricity going out five minutes before the game comes on. You expect it to be there all the time. But, you know, we got 670,000 electric customers in South Carolina, probably close to a little over a third of the state is below poverty level. And those are our customers. So when you're serving customers, it's not always people that can afford to pay their energy bill. You have people that are challenged to paying that energy bill every day. And it takes leadership to figure out how you're going to deal with those challenges and how you're going to treat people the right way. And if there's one theme you'll find about when I talk about leadership, it has to do with how you treat people. Because at the end of the day, that's who you're serving. Whether it's a large group or a small group, or it's customers, investors, you're serving people and you can't really separate those. So I like to go down to the call center a couple times a year where all the calls come in. You can just plug in on the microphone and, and listen to these calls that come in. These people are challenged. They're, they're trying to figure out a way to pay their bill. And in most circumstances, it's not they, won't, they don't want to complain about the cost of their service. What they're complaining about is how to figure out how they're going to pay for it. And so we try to find ways to work with them. And it would be easier for us just to say, you know, we're not going to do that. You, know, you just got to figure out how to pay your bill or we're, we're going to turn it off. Uh, but I'm proud of our team because last year we found a little over $10 million in assistance, not money that we paid, but we connected customers with agencies around the state that could help them find money to pay their bills. And I think that's, I think that's an example of leadership on its own, trying to make sure you can, you can deal with those customers. We have critical infrastructure. You know, we've got to protect our system against uh, cyber attacks and, and terrorists. Uh, you think about the criticality of what we do around the nation. And the facilities we all have to protect us are served with electricity primarily, so you have to make sure that that electricity is there. 
environmental impacts, uh, I'll tell you right up front, we do, do burn coal on our system and, and we dam rivers because we have hydroelectric facilities on our system. Some of them go back to the 1800s. We got one down in Stevens Creek uh, right near Augusta uh, that some of the old timers tell me when that facility came online, it produced almost two thirds of the electricity that was used in the whole state of Georgia. And now it's probably one of the smallest generators on our system, but because it's on the river and because it has environmental concerns, we have to follow very strict regulations to do that. I probably don't need to say a whole lot about coal because everybody knows about coal and everybody talks about it being bad and ugly and dirty and all those things. Well, over half of the energy in this nation right now is, is produced from coal. And uh, while it is going away, and I think you'll see lower amounts of coal in the future, it, it is still something we need and we gotta make sure we do it responsibly as long as it's available to us. Uh, safety perspective, you know, we operate a nuclear plant. Uh, that's not something you can take your eye off the ball on. You gotta be very attentive to what you're doing and if you think you work in a regulated world, go work with the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, everything they do in terms of what you have to do to build a nuclear plant. And we are building two new nuclear plants right now. There are only four of those going up in the country. We're building two in uh, Georgia Power through the Southern Company right here in, in Georgia is building two. So the only new nuclear plants being built in the United States are probably within 100 miles of, of where you sit right here today. And I think that's pretty impressive uh, for the South. We have high voltage transmission and, and distribution lines. Uh, the line that work on our system, that's probably the, the sixth most dangerous job in the world. I mean, you're up there dealing with, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of volts and trying to make sure you do that safely uh, is a big deal. Uh, we want people to go home safely uh, every day. And for us, it's, it's a leadership challenge. Any job that's done where somebody gets injured is a failure for us. Uh, we don't want anybody to get injured in any way, shape, or form. And we spend a lot of time talking about safety every day. And if the leaders aren't taking responsibility for that, it's not going to happen. Because what you do, people pay attention to. And if you say it's important, they'll believe it's important. But if you ignore it, it it's not going to happen. So you got to make sure you pay attention to that. Economic development, uh, we're a leader in the state. Another example of leadership, we work hard to help the state expand. Uh, we compete with the state of Georgia and North Carolina and other states, try to attract a new industry to the state. Uh, Georgia just got a big contract for, for Caterpillar uh, coming to the state. Uh, we were number two. We hated to lose that one, but guess what? We got Boeing. <laughs> okay, We got Boeing that's coming to North Charleston. They're building a new 787 Dreamliner. Uh, tremendous facility uh, trying to build, that, build those planes. The building is amazing. It will hold seven 747 planes inside, and there's not a single support inside that building. It, it's all open. Uh, and when they, when they came to us, they said, we want to have renewable energy on this facility. And so we worked with them and we put a solar laminate roof on the top of that building to cover it up. It produces about 2.6 megawatts. And when they're not getting energy from that, uh, we feed them energy from a wood chip facility close by. So when they roll their planes out, they can say their planes are built with 100% renewable energy. Uh, that was a big challenge for them. So we were able to satisfy that requirement. It's a great employer in the state. We're regulated, uh, we got people looking over our shoulder all the time, whether it's the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, the Public Service Commission, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the IRS. We've always got somebody watching us. So you have to do things right. Uh, if you don't, you get penalties and fines and the worst, worst circumstance, uh, you can go to jail. I don't, I don't care to do that. I like to work hard and go home at the end of the day and, and sleep well. So it's a lot easier to do things right than try to, try to cut corners. And from a shareholder perspective, you know, we, we raise our money uh, from shareholders. Uh, they expect us to, you know, provide them returns. A lot of people, some people called it the, the widows and, and orphan stock a long time ago because it has a dividend that's paid, and the people expect to have that dividend every month or every quarter when they come out to, to live on. So we like to try to keep those, those expectations the same. Let me translate there into kind of my, my experiences on leadership, and I could probably talk as long as you wanted to on the different experiences, but I'm gonna to try to keep it within the time frame we got, because I know you got big things to do for, for the weekend, but I would define leadership in, in my terms is helping a group of individuals do something together that they couldn't accomplish alone. Okay, if you're leading by definition, you got people that are hopefully following you. And as I tell people, you know, for people to follow you, that's optional. You can't make people follow you. So you have to be straightforward, you have to be able to generate enough excitement, and you have to make sure they understand what you're trying to accomplish for them want to follow you. I was in the bookstore the other day and I just went over to the, the business section where they had self-help books and all these different things, and I probably should have counted the number of books, but I'm sure there were over 100 books on, on leadership 
on those shelves. So you know, each one of you in this room could write a book on leadership, and you'd be right because it is what you define it. And it would be what your experiences are. Some of you may have some, some great leadership experiences today. Uh, some of you may, may think you haven't. I would, I would tend to, to disagree with that because I think you start leadership uh, early in your life. I didn't start out in life thinking, I want to be a leader. Okay, I, I had this vision when I graduated from college, and I really don't know where it came from, that if I made $12,000 a year or $1,000 a month, I was home free. Okay, don't know where that number came from. Probably heard something from my dad or my mom. So when I got my first job, I made $12,300 a year. Thinking, I got $300 spending money. I'm in, I'm in great shape. <laughs> It didn't last long. I got, I got uh, indoctrinated to taxes and health insurance, and then we had our first child, and all those things came along, and I realized that probably wasn't going to be it, so I needed to work a little bit harder to see if I could make some more money. But I would offer to you, you know, you're exposed to, to parents, you know, teachers, coaches, bosses, and, and friends, and you get the, the power of observation to learn from these people and uh, trying to find out, you know, what do you like, what do you dislike about the way people do things. Think about all the ways you could coach a baseball team, a kid's baseball team. You know, you're trying to coach a team, you got some rabid parent chewing you in the ear saying, you're not playing my kid, you know. You got a chance for leadership there, you know. How, how are you gonna manage that? And I, I kind of jotted down, you know, different jobs that I had, and I just kind of jotted down. I was a paper boy, I was a lawn boy, I washed windows. I used to have a hotel up there where the big fire station is in Five Points now, that was the downtown or motor end. And I washed windows, you talk about a boring job, all the windows were the same, and just floor after floor, but, but I did it, need, needed money. I wrapped gifts down at uh, Foster's Jewelers, I'm sure that's still downtown. When I didn't have gifts to wrap, I had to go on the, the blue carpet down there and clean up all the, all the dirt in the floor, so I learned a lot from uh, Joe Foster who ran that place about how you treat people. I sold grandfather clocks. I went by last night to see if the store was still there, and, and it's gone. Where Kroger is over there at Alps, there was a a long strip mall there that had stores, and we sold grandfather clocks out of that store, and I think Tim helped me deliver a couple of those along the way. <laughs> it was a big deal when you sold a grandfather clock. You could actually eat steak that night instead of hamburgers or something else. <laughs> and where the, where the Shell station is up at Five Points, so that used to be a Gulf station, it was McMullen's Gulf, and I, I pumped gas at the gas station, and right down the road there was this place called Diamond Gas that came in, self-service. Who ever thought people would pump their own gas? <laughs> But you know what? You don't see many people that don't pump their own gas nowadays, but that was, that was a different thing back then, so you have to be willing to change. And I went on to become an accountant. I got my CPA certificate and practiced in public accounting. I taught night school, and then all the different jobs I've had with the company. Every one of those has been a learning opportunity for me. And I remember telling myself when I worked for different people, well, if I ever get in charge, I'm not going to do it like that. Or if I get in charge, I want to be like this person. I want to be like that lady. I want to do it this way. So every opportunity you get a chance to interact with people is a great way for you to learn, and I would encourage you to take those opportunities. I would see leadership in, in two categories. You got personal leadership, and then you got you know leadership as you would think about it from an organizational perspective. But it starts with the individual. I would offer to you, if you don't have individual leadership, you're probably never going to be given the opportunity for organizational leadership, unless you know somebody you come up in a family business. How many times do you see a family business where somebody comes to the top because they got the name, but they're not a good leader because they haven't paid the price. I'm not saying that all they're not all good leader or bad leaders, but you got to work your way up and, and learn from those experiences. So you have to accept that responsibility as an individual before you can take it on for an organization. We have a great course we, we do in our company. We started probably 10 years ago called Personal Leadership. And we get people from all around the company and, and they go together in teams. And you have people that have been with the company for 30 years, you have people that have been there for 30 days. You have people that are from accounting, they're from operations, from plant operations, and different organizations around the company, and they work on projects. And what they learn is they learn how to come together as a team, and that everybody's valuable on that team, whether you're the newest person or the oldest person. Because everybody has to have a skill set. And sometimes being a leader is stepping back and letting somebody else lead. You don't always have to be first. If you're talking about the team and leadership, it's about the team winning. It's not about you winning. I couldn't do what I do today if I didn't have 6,000 people supporting me. There's no way. I mean, people ask me, how do you sign off on the financial statements? How do you sign the Form 10-K at the end of the day and feel good about it? It's because I trust the people that work for me. 
Otherwise, I'd, I'd be a scary person. I wouldn't be able to sleep at night, and I, and I like to sleep. I need to try to do those things. So start as an individual, and only then will you be given the opportunity, in my opinion, to lead a, lead a large organization. I sat down and, and wrote down a lot of things that I would, I would like to say about leadership, and I kind of came up with my, my top ten list. So if you'll, you'll bear with me, I won't go to these in any particular order of, of, of priority, but I, I wrote down what's important to me that I think you need to have if you're going to be successful as a leader. And I've gathered these up from, from my years of experience, not just as a leader, but just my years of experience of watching people in, in different organizations. The first one would be, you know, setting clear goals and expectations. If you're going to lead an organization or lead a team, you know, it could be a team of three people. It doesn't have to be a team of 6,000. You know, you've got to have a clear plan and set goals. And you've got to be able to communicate that plan to the people you expect to follow you. You know, the worst thing to do is to head down a path and turn around and all of a sudden nobody's with you. So if you can't communicate to your team what's important and why it's important and where the end goal is and why that matters, you're going to have a hard time motivating those people to follow you and be in line when you need them to. Take personal responsibility for assignments. You know, people talk about delegation. Delegation doesn't mean you're no longer responsible. It means you've engaged other people to help you accomplish the task, but you've still got to take personal responsibility. I can assure you if our company has a big hiccup, the board's not going down to some accountant that might have made a bad accounting entry. They're coming to me. They're going to say, how did that happen? You know, I'm the one that gets to stand up at the annual shareholders meeting and talk about what's going on. I'm the one that gets to field the questions, so I, I feel that personal responsibility, but you can only do that by, by staying close to that team and making sure even as you delegate, you don't just throw it out and say, bring it back when it's done. So you got to keep that personal responsibility as you go. Nobody cares like you care. Have you ever called, get some computer help? How many times do you get somebody that works in the United States? And I'm not trying to malign anybody that's outside the United States, but very rarely do you get somebody that, that lives here in the United States. Anytime I call a call center, I'm like, okay, where are you located? You know, it's rare if it's even in the United States. We made a decision in our company that you call our shareholder services. If you want to buy, sell stock, or deal with shareholder services in our company, you call our company, they're sitting right in that building on the main floor. So if you walk in, you can walk right in there and see them because nobody cares like they care. And they, they know the company, they know the organization, they know the history, and they can have good interchange with their customers and shareholders as they, as they call. So nobody cares like, like you do. You need to create an environment uh, that encourages uh, participation. I got one great board member, and I went around and got my responsibilities a couple of years ago. I went around and interviewed all the board members. Okay, tell me what you like, tell me what you don't like about what's going around the company, and what would be your advice to me? And I, one guy was describing how he thought the company ought to work and how the board ought to work. He says, we've really got to have some debate around these issues. He said, it's okay to disagree, but you can't be disagreeable. Now, there, there's, there's a fine line there. But, you know, disagreements and, and many times generate the best ideas because you've got a dialogue going on and you're exchanging information. If you just always did everything the same way you do it, the nation wouldn't be anywhere. Uh, as a business world, we'd be doing the same things they were done 30 years ago and we wouldn't even be competitive as a nation. So you've always got to have that dialogue and, and that debate to make sure you got that participation and that you encourage that. And I know some of the best discussions I've ever had on big issues in the company, we would get a team in a room. I want to say there were people hollering and screaming, but there were some people that were hollering and screaming by the time we were done because we were trying to find the right answer. And at the end of the day, we were still friends. You could walk out and say, well, I'm glad we solved that problem. I had a boss that used to do that. He'd call me upstairs and cuss me up one side and down the other about all the things he thought I was doing wrong. He'd say, you want to go to lunch? I'm like, no, I don't want to go to lunch. I said, I want to see you for the next two days. But he was really trying to challenge me and, and help me and that's one of the guys I learned a lot about challenging from. I said, I don't be quite as strong as he was in the way he did it, but I, but I picked that up from him. This is one of my favorites. Uh, don't compromise on values. The strong values you need, but accept personalities. Okay? We work in a world today that is so diverse, it's incredible. And if you don't embrace that diversity and, and people in your organization and how they need to work together, you won't be successful because that's the, that's the way you learn from others and you have to listen to others' ideas. You, know, you can't have 6,000 of the same type of people in an organization to get done what needs to be done. You've got to have some differences. I compare this as I, as I grew up. I thought I grew up in a, in a great family. I still think I had a great family, but you, you grow up and you think, 
my family's perfect. Why isn't everybody's family like mine? And then as you go to high school, you see you got to meet different families, and then you meet people in, in college that say, ooh, you know, maybe, maybe my family's not perfect. I got some people in my family that are crazy. <laughs> and then as you get out of college and you get into the workplace and you start to meet other families, interact with other people, what you realize is everybody's crazy. <laughs> okay? And that's okay because it's that diversity that enables us to find the differences that will help us pull a solution together when nobody else could. I love it when our company does things that people say, oh, you're too small to do that. Oh, that's just a challenge when somebody says that. And we get our team together and figure out how are we going to go do that. And we did that with our nuclear plant. Uh, there were 22 companies that said we're going to build a nuclear plant 10 years ago. Only two left, and we're one of them. And people said, you can't do it. You're not, not big enough. You don't have enough people in your company to do that, and we're doing it. And that, that's an excitement for us, and it's a challenge. So make sure you don't compromise on values, but, but accept those, those personalities. Share information and ideas. It's not what you know, but what you share with other people it's going to bring together solutions that you might not have thought of. This is kind of getting back to the personalities a little bit, but I, but I think it is different. But you've got to be able to, to share your ideas. And as I said earlier, there are not many things you can do alone. You've you got to have a team to do it. If I decided, well, I'm going to go build a nuclear plant, well, I'd still be out there with a pickaxe right now just trying to chip up the dirt to get down to where the foundation is going to go. But I've got a team of 3,000 people that's already cleared the trees, leveled the ground, gone down 45 feet to the granite, and poured enough concrete to get ready to pour the foundation for the nuclear plant. I couldn't do that by myself. We'd run out of time. Technology would probably be over by the time I got through. I'm sure I'd be dead by then. But I mean, you've got to be able to engage other people and make sure you're sharing information and ideas and, and get over the blind spots that you've got. I would offer to you that even my best friend Tim here, you know, we're both in accounting, we both went to Georgia, had many of the same teachers, got a lot of the same ideas, but we've probably got different thought processes about how we might accomplish. I'm sure mine's better than his, but I mean, <laughs> I'm just picking that stuff. But I mean, but you know, you, you got to have different ideas, even though you got some of the same backgrounds, and think about the different backgrounds you, you, you might run into. I know one of my next one down here is, you know, building teams and not walls. Uh, when I was in public accounting, Pretty much everybody in the firm was an accountant or a CPA, and they, they did accounting work. Everybody was focused on the same types of things. But when I made the jump to go from public accounting to industry, I went from a firm that had, you know, maybe 80 people in, it in, in my local office, all accountants, to a firm that had, at that time, probably 3,000 people. And I found out accountants were the lowest people on the totem pole because this company was run by engineers. You know, we had power plants and power lines and gas lines and gas mains we installed, and that was done by the engineers. The accountants didn't have anything to do with that. So we had to convince people, you know, we were valuable. And I always give the great example. Uh, when I took over the, the electric company a couple of years ago as, as president, one of the secretaries for the vice president of electric operations came up to see me. She was talking about the power plants. She said, you know, these power plants are important. She looked at me and says, you know, they're, they're really important. I said, yeah, I know they're important. She said, that's where we make the money. And I looked at her. I said, no. I said, that's where you make the electricity. And I said, you know, once, you, once it leaves the plant, I said, it's got to get to the lines. It's got to get to the customers. Somebody's got to bill it. Somebody's got to set the rate. Somebody's got to collect it. Somebody's got to put it in the bank. Somebody's got to invest it. And I said, there are a lot of people doing that. So we don't just make money there. They make electricity, which gives us the opportunity to make money. And I've spent a lot of time in, in my career trying to, to break down the walls between large organizations where you've got administration, the, the dreaded administration group, all those people that do accounting and legal and human resources and things that, uh, that engineers, you know, think are, you know, just beneath them. You know, we don't be engineers. I said, well, you know, we got engineers in Georgia. They go to Georgia Tech. And I said, they build all those buildings we work in. You know, so I think that's something great. They're helping us out. <laughs> But you have to accept those personalities and find ways to, to break down those walls because I can assure you I don't want the director of my tax department setting foot in the control room at the nuclear plant. I don't want him anywhere near there. He might say, well, what does this button do? Just start pushing that button. And I don't want the guy that works in the control room filing the tax return because they both have complex rules and regulations behind them, but it takes different skill sets to get that done. So when they can learn to work together as teams, and that's one of the reasons why we put that personal leadership group together is try to put that message in our employees early in their careers so they can see how it all comes together. Now, 
You'll see these things as you go through your career, and you, you'll be able to pick up on those. Be a problem solver, uh, not an obstacle. Don't referee leaders. If you got leaders you have to referee, get rid of them because they're not helping you. Leaders are supposed to pro solve problems and make sure you can, you can advance the ball uh, down the field. Learn from your failures and experiences. Uh, I talked earlier about coming to Georgia. It was a real step out for us to leave the, the comfort of a regulated world where you set your rates and you go to the commission and get everything done and it's approved to come to Georgia where it was unregulated. And we spent more time trying to figure out how we wouldn't fail than what we would do if we were to succeed. Uh, we thought we'd have 30,000 customers in two years. We had 3,000 customers in six months and we weren't prepared for it. We lost $45 million our first year in Georgia through advertising and promotion, trying to gather up customers. I was CFO at the time, and I can remember standing in front of my board saying, oh, this is a good thing. They thought I was crazy. You know, we'd never lost $45 million on a business venture in our career, but it was our first foray out into something that was unregulated, and we were learning. And it was a great investment, because I looked at that $45 million as an investment, because we don't own any pipes in Georgia. Atlanta Gaslight still owns all the pipes and all the meters. All we do is buy the gas and pay them the fee to move it through that to get it to your house. So we don't have any assets here. We're just serving and marketing, and that, and that was very different for us. Now, the last thing I want to talk about, I, I don't give a speech because my secretary, my assistant always says, are you going to talk about the Frisbee and the rubber ball? Well, yes, I'm going to talk about the Frisbee and the rubber ball. So some of y'all heard me last year when I talked to the accounting group. You're going to hear it again, but I think it's one of the most important things that I like to give as an example if you don't remember anything I said today, if you can remember this, you're halfway home to being successful. I like to give examples that people can remember. This picture of a red rubber ball like you used to have at the playground, nothing, nothing fancy about the ball, just a plain red rubber ball and a Frisbee. Okay? I break people down into two types. You're going to be a Frisbee or you're going to be a rubber ball. If you hadn't run into these two, trust me, you will, and you'll know the difference when you see them. If you think about that Frisbee, it looks great on the top. Sometimes it's a marketing tool. It's got advertisements. It may have some chrome stickers and stuff on it. It's really shiny, and it's appealing. And you can throw it, and it'll, it'll sail through the air, and it's pretty impressive. Probably a little bit more fun than just a plain rubber ball. But the difference is, if you look up underneath, it's hollow. There's nothing exciting about the bottom side of the Frisbee. There's nothing to it. you got people like that in the workplace. Some people look real good when management's looking down on them. Or they're looking up to management. They're going to do everything they can to make themselves look good in front of management. They're not going to take care of their people. They're going to abuse their people. And where are the people? They're on the bottom side of that Frisbee. They're down there saying, I'm getting abused and kicked around and ignored and nobody listens to my ideas and this guy doesn't care about what I'm doing. All he's trying to do is keep the top people happy. And if you go to somebody at the top and you say, let me tell you about Joe over here and what he's doing, they're like, Joe? He wouldn't do that. He's just the greatest guy in the world. But he's a Frisbee because he looks different to the people on top than he does in the organization. Now think about the rubber ball. You want to be like a rubber ball. You want to look the same to everybody. I don't care if it's your boss, your peers on the side, or somebody that works below you. You should be the same and you should act the same and you should treat everybody the same no matter what their position is in life if you're going to be an effective leader. Because there is no difference. No individual is any more important than the other individual when it comes to caring for people. And that's the difference between authority and respect. I would tell you we have authority in organizations just so you can have organizational structure and make decisions and get things done. And some people have more authority. I have more authority in my organization than somebody we hired last week that might work in customer service. But that person in customer service deserves the same level of respect from me that I'm going to give to the board of directors when they come to town and start asking me about what's going on in the business. So I'm going to do my best to look the same to everybody, just like that rubber ball, no matter where you're looking at it, it looks the same. If you're a Frisbee, think about tossing that Frisbee. It's going to go along real well for a long period of time, and then it's going to fall to the ground. Just like some people do in that organization, they look real good, and when they fall to the ground, they look around, and nobody's going to help them get up. I fired too. I can remember, that's when I came up with this example. After I fired the first one, I found the second one. I said, ooh, she's got to go too. Held the door open for her while she left. I was nice. <laughs> but I said, you know, nobody else is going to help you here because you're a Frisbee. You're on the ground. We're not going to help you get back up. Now, if you're a rubber ball and you make a mistake, 
you've taken some risk in your job and you reached out there to try to do some different things and you fail, what's going to happen to that rubber ball? It's going to bounce back. Somebody's going to catch it. Somebody's going to pick it up and say, let's, let's live to play another day. So if you can remember those two things and understand the difference between authority and respect, I think you'll be halfway there and you'll be ready to have some great experiences in your career and you'll be off to, to the, long, the long road of leadership wherever that leads, and maybe you'll write one of those books one day, and I'll say, oh, we got another book here we can read about. Because your experiences will be different from mine. They'll be different depending on which organizations you work in, which career path you choose, and it'll change. But don't ever forget the difference between authority and respect, working as a team, accepting values, accept, I mean, keeping the values the same, but accepting differences in personalities, and I think you'll, you'll have a lot of fun along the way. I think my time's about run out, so I'm going to kind of wrap up here and I'll give you a chance to ask me some questions, but I've enjoyed being here. I hope I've given you something you can, you can hold on to and at least remember a couple of things as you, as you head throughout your careers. And I wish you the best of luck. You're going to have a great education, I can tell you that. Uh, my education did me a lot of good, and I look back on those days and had a big impact on, on my success. So, so thanks for your patience and, and listening to me. Okay. We have time for a few questions, so... Hi, my name is Whitney Brick, and I have a question about what attributes do you think a person should have in order to be a leader? Well, the first thing I would tell you is you have to care. If, if people don't think you care about them, they're not inclined to follow you. So I, that, that's the highest one on my list in being able to treat people fairly. Uh, you're going to have to make tough decisions, and so you're going to have to try your best to be consistent when you make those decisions so when people look at you, they may not like the decisions you make because you may make something that they thought you should have gone another direction. They can say, well, you know, she listened to me. She evaluated the results. She made the decision, and I'll, I'll accept that. Uh, I tell people if, if we make a decision and it's ethical, it's legal, and it's moving in the direction we want to go, that if you work in that organization, you know, you're, you're duty-bound to follow it, even though you might have a different opinion as long as you got your chance to, to air your, your, your view. Hi, my name is India Bender, and I just wanted to know what is, have been some of the most difficult obstacles you've overcome as you've risen up to some of your higher leadership positions? Uh, the biggest thing was I was afraid to stand out in front of a group and talk to people. <laughs> it's hard to say coming from a minister, but I think he kept all the genes, so I had, I had to work hard at it, which is one of the reasons I taught night school. I said, I can go teach accounting in night school. At least I know the accounting, so I can try to figure out how do you stand out in front of a group and, and talk, and, and that really helped me. So I think, you know, being trying to get comfortable in, in communicating, even if it's an idea that some people aren't going to like. I mean, one of the toughest things I have to do, at least on a semi-annual basis, is stand in front of our retirees when they're saying, you know, why don't you raise our pensions? Well, you know, we can't afford to raise a the pension. They're just one group in the organization. We raise them periodically, but not every year. And you got to be able to communicate that in a way that they appreciate that you understand and you care, but you're, you're making a fair decision. So I think Communicating those decisions in, in those tough situations is, is difficult. Uh, I spend a lot of time on the witness stand at the Public Service Commission when we go in for rate increases we had to have our nuclear plant approved. And, and I've got to convince them that it's a good thing to spend $10 billion on two nuclear plants and then ask the customers to pay for them because, you know, that's who's going to pay for them at the end of the day. And if I don't have the credibility with that commission, they're not going to believe me. So I think it's a, it's a series of decisions you have to make that give you that credibility that, that help you in the long term. So maintaining that credibility is a, is a, is a challenge. And doing the right thing, I, I thought about this this morning and somebody asked me a question, I, I'm going to give you this example. We sold a propane gas company probably 10 years ago. It was a small piece of our organization and we were going to sell it. And we had three bidders on the property. And the night before we were supposed to meet with the the successful bidder who had previously refused to give us any down payment to lock down the deal. And we had in the contract, no deal is final until you, you sign on the deal or make a deposit. He refused to do that. And he had a history of backing out of deals. Somebody called us on the phone the night before and said, I understand you're getting ready to sell this property to X. He said, I'll pay you whatever they're going to pay you plus 20%. Now, we didn't have a signed contract. This was a legitimate person that had the cash to make the deal. We had told this guy, you need to, you know, you need to go ahead and pay up so we can lock this deal down. And we debated as a company what to do. We took the higher offer. Went to court, got sued, 
lost the case. And if the attorney said, oh, no, you'll, you'll win the case, and that's another thing. Attorneys will always tell you they can win the case <laughs> until it goes to the jury. Then it's, oh, anything can happen when it goes to the jury. So be careful when you're dealing with attorneys. Good people, they, you've got to make the decision at the end of the day. I learned from that, even though legally we were right, it was not the right thing to do. And I think, you know, we could have defended what we did, and we did defend what we did in court. But I sat in the courtroom and listened to all the witnesses. I went back and told the CEO, I was CFO at the time, I said, we're going to lose. And we did. So that had a big impact on me. So doing what's right is not always what you have the legal right to do. And that was a big lesson for me. Yes. Hi, my name is Ann Adams, and I'd like to know what influenced you to leave the to leave the county, and what how did you know is the right time to go from company to company, or from which job to which job? That that was a challenge because you know when I I didn't realize I was going to go into accounting. I was wandering around the university trying to figure out what I could do here that would make life worthwhile, and couldn't find anything. And finally, a friend of my dad's who was an accounting major, accounting professor here at the time, said, "Well, come try my class," and I did, and I, and I enjoyed it. So I went into accounting. And, and I loved it. I loved public accounting because you got to see a lot of different kinds of industries. I like to see the way people make things because I'm kind of, a, I guess, an engineer wannabe at heart that came up on the, on the number side. So it, it was tough, but as I spent more and more of my time on, on public utilities, I, I became designated the public utility specialist, so I spent most of my time dealing with utility issues. And it just seemed to be an, an industry that had a lot to offer in a, in a long-term career uh, that I thought could be, could be successful on the accounting side. So, I mean, I thought, you know, my, my goal was maybe to be controller one day, which, which I was, you know, four or five years after I joined the company. Never having any idea it would, it would lead to this. So, I mean, it's, uh, I just enjoyed that type of work. Uh, the utilities had a big appeal to me. Uh, it was a large organization. They had large projects. We just finished our first nuclear plant at the time, and it was a, it was a horrible time in the industry. I think interest rates were 16 percent. We sold bonds, first mortgage bonds, it paid 16%. percent How'd you like to have some of those in your portfolio right now? We recalled those suckers as fast as we could. But I mean, it was, it was a different time. It was a challenging time for utilities, and I, and I just had an interest. It was tough because uh, I enjoyed public accounting. I, I loved the work. I, I loved the different industries. And I'd like to think I could have been successful if I stayed, but I, but I made the turn and, and jumped the fence. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Yes. Have you seen a change in business ethics over your career, and how would you say that's impacting oh, the way business is Absolutely. I mean, it was, uh, I'll tell from personal experience, there was a joke book they used to pass around the accounting department. It was about that thick, and these things had been Xeroxed 50 times and passed around from person to person. It's some of the greatest jokes in the world at the time. And then we adopted a corporate compliance policy in our organization about 15 years ago, which we train everybody in the organization every year and it's a condition of employment. And we train everybody from you know, sexual harassment to how you deal in contracts to release of public information. It covers a broad spectrum. And I, I have seen a big change in, in the business world because once that course came out, I called down to accounting. I said, I don't know who's got the book now, but tell them it's got to go because that's no longer acceptable in, in the organization. So I have seen standards really change over the years, and that's been a good thing uh, because whether it's discrimination you know, for race or, or, or sex or whatever it might be, I think, for the most part, I'd like to think an organization that's gone, uh, but it was a path for us to get there. Uh, we, we had discrimination suits with minorities out in the field that felt like they were mistreated by, by workers in the field, and we did some investigations, found out, you know what, they're, they're right. And then we had to make changes and, and let people go, and you put, make some examples out of some people. So I, you need to have those ethics in the company. I think that's what's helped our company be successful over the, the last 15, 20 years is because we made that transition. Some of these companies that have failed, I don't think they ever made the transition. And, and once you make it, it becomes so part of you and what you do, just not what, it, what you do at work, but what you do outside of work and, and conversations you might have with your friends. You say, we, we, we shouldn't be having that, that conversation. That, that doesn't feel good. Uh, I was even with my daughter who was going to buy a gag gift for somebody at Christmas last year, and she said, I, I want to get this. And I said, no. I said, that, that doesn't really send the right message, right message. It might offend somebody. And when she thought about it, she said, yeah, I never really thought about it that way. And that's because I'd been through the training, and I was looking at it differently than she did. It was a joke, but it might not be a joke to somebody. So, uh, you know, business ethics, if, if you can't work with the ethics, you're going to have a problem. It's just a matter of when. And uh, there's just so much scrutiny today about what we do. And, you know, there's probably somebody watching us now filming something to stick it out there. But, I mean, it's a, 
you just have to be be careful. But it's a lot better, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Well, on behalf of the Institute for Leadership Advancement and the Perry College of Business, we'd like to thank you for seeing us. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Appreciate it. That's great. I'll be right in my office. Yeah. I'll have a I'll have a great place for that in my office. All my all my Carolina fans friends, you know, don't want me to put all my Georgia stuff up, but I sure if you come to my office, I got a picture of Ugga on the door that, that, I, that I put at the beginning of football season, and uh, I keep that there just to try to keep them honest, and they always give me a hard time, and they came and they used to dress my bulldog up and, you know, hide him and put him in Gamecock clothes, and I figure out where, where he's going to get a little bulldog out sitting on the floor, so we, we have a lot of fun, but I will, I will put that in there, and I tell them that's, that's the way you enter a, a real university. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.